Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, from the heart of Central Texas. It's Tuesday night, and this is Breaking the Chain. Tonight, we're going to have engine break-in discussions with guest speaker Mike Bush. Uh, my name is Jeremy Walters. I'm an ATP, Master CFI, major in U.S. Army Reserves, and content creator. Uh, this is an all-American aviation YouTube uh, production, and I'm a former U.S. Army 864 Apache helicopter pilot and CFI. I enjoy teaching, love, inspiring, and motivating people to do the right thing and also um, go out and do something better with yourself. Uh, I'm supported by my beloved family of seven total in our household, my wife Talia and our five children, and that's my Luscom 8E Miss Betsy Blue. Assisting me tonight is this good looking gentleman by the name of Paul Nadal. Paul is an instrument rated private pilot. He loves to donate time, his time for greater causes. He helps assist me with this program. He participates in angel flights and also is a U.S. Navy veteran from Desert Storm. Hey, tonight, I just wanted to take a quick moment and congratulate my private pilot student that I started with last uh, March, uh, Miss Abby Andrews. She just turned 17 back in early December, and she took her check ride with a local DPE by the name of Pat Brown uh, for a private pilot certificate. And not only is Abby um, my youngest student that I've ever taken from ground zero, or not ground zero, but from zero flight time to private pilot, she's my first female student to take for an initial private pilot uh, rating. Not the first female student that I've taken through. I had Marissa Beckett go through her seaplane add-on with me last year, um, but Abby's my first private pilot female student take from, um, from no flight time all the way through. And we're gonna be starting her instrument rating pretty soon. On that note, with this slide, for all of my guests and participants who joined this program, I would really love to know if you had just taken a check ride or if you're an instructor and you've got anybody that you'd like me to congratulate or give a shout out to as part of this program um, moving forward. All right. Tonight, we welcome back for the second time to break in the chain, Mike Bush. Mike is arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. He writes the monthly savvy maintenance column in the AOPA pilot magazine and hosts free monthly EAA sponsored maintenance webinars. He's also returning back to breaking the chain and we're grateful that he's here tonight. Mike is a mathematician by training and he received his bachelor's of arts degree in mathematics at Dartmouth College. Mike has helped thousands of aircraft owners solve thorny maintenance problems that have stumped their local AMPs. In 1995, Mike co-founded AvWeb and served as its editor-in-chief and investigative journalist and, until it sailed to Belvoir Publications in 2002. Mike's company, Savvy Aviation Incorporated, provides a broad palette of maintenance related services to thousands of owners of piston GA airplanes. Uh, those services include ma a maintenance management and consulting program, engine monitor da data analysis, a nationwide pre buy management program, and a 24 7 breakdown assistant program, assistance program that's essentially the AAA of general aviation. Uh, in 2008, Mike was honored as a national aviation maintenance technician of the year by the FAA administrator. Uh, he has been a pilot and an aircraft owner for more than 55 years with over 8,000 hours logged. He's a commercial pilot with an instrument, single engine and multi-engine land, uh, single engine C, glider ratings. He's a CFI for airplanes and instruments and multi-engine airplanes. And he's an AMP with an IA or inspection authorization. Tonight, it is my distinct honor to introduce and welcome back Mr. Mike Bush. Mike, your show. Well, thank you very much. 
I appreciate uh, that introduction, Jeremy. Um, uh, let me see if I can uh, share my screen because I have uh, some slides that I'd like to share with everybody. So give me just a second and let me see if I can accomplish that. And hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Got it, Mike. Very good. <clears throat> well, uh, this evening, I'd like to talk to you about a subject that um, every aircraft owner uh, has to uh, deal with from time to time, uh, and that is uh, breaking in new cylinders. Um, we, we need to do this when we replace one or two cylinders, uh, either with new ones or with uh, ones that have been uh, reconditioned and rehoned. We certainly need to do it when we replace all the cylinders, the uh, so-called top overhaul. Um, and uh, anytime we, we uh, uh, overhaul the, the entire engine or install a rebuilt or a new engine, um, we're dealing with, with new cylinders. We have to deal with a break-in process. But now, there's a lot of information <clears throat> that you'll find written on this subject. Um, both Continental and Lycoming have weighed in on break-in procedure in, in uh, service bulletins. Um, several of the PMA cylinder manufacturers, uh, Superior Air Parts and the late lamented uh, ECI have write-ups on how they think break-in should be done. A number of overhaul shops have their own opinions on how break-in should be done. Uh, I've discovered write-ups by, by uh, Ram Aircraft uh, Penyan, Victor Aviation, and even Shell Oil Company. <laughs> uh, ben Visser of Shell Oil weighed in on, on, on break-in. So there's a lot of information out there about it. But if you look at it, it's, it's a little bit confusing. Um, there are some common threads that everybody seems to agree on, but there's an awful lot of disagreement about how to do break-in properly, you know, what power settings to use, what kind of oil to use, how long the break-in oil should stay in before you change it, and generally how long break-in should take. So I'd kind of like to give you my take on all this stuff and, and I'd, I'd like to start going back to first principles and um, just talk a little bit, bit about what we're trying to accomplish <clears throat> when, we, uh, when we break in a new cylinder on a piston aircraft engine. Um, our, our cylinders, uh, uh, are fairly complicated uh, assemblies. Uh, these two pictures are, are li of Lycoming cylinders. Uh, Continental cylinders look pretty similar. Uh, they consist of a, an aluminum alloy cylinder head uh, that is uh, mated uh, to a hardened steel barrel. Um, uh, the barrels uh, come in various configurations, they can, they can be through hardened steel, they can be nitrided steel, uh, both Continental and Lycoming's factory cylinders are nitride hardened, uh, hardened steel barrels. But they can also come uh, in uh, nickel uh, carbide plated barrels, um, which uh, ECI pioneered and, and now Continental provides uh, um, car, uh, nickel carbide uh, uh, cylinders as an alternative to standard seal cylinders if you want to order them that way. Uh, running up inside that uh, cylinder is an aluminum uh, alloy piston. Um, and the piston has at least three rings, sometimes four. Uh, the top two rings are the compression rings and their job is to seal the combustion chamber and to prevent uh, uh, combustion gases from uh, getting past the, the ring pack and into the crankcase. And they do a moderately efficient job of doing that. They don't seal perfectly, but they seal pretty well. Um, then there's an oil control ring, that third ring down, whose job it is to smear oil on the cylinder walls as the piston goes up and down to keep everything lubricated and to uh, basically regulate the thickness of the oil film. And on some pistons, uh, there is a fourth ring that's located down below the piston pin, pin called a scraper ring. Um, you, you tend to see those on larger bore cylinders and not to see them on smaller bore cylinders. This particular 
uh, piston that we're looking at in the picture does not have a scraper ring, but, uh, but some do. And the scraper ring is uh, way down below the piston pin. It's not near the, the other three rings. So at any rate, as the piston reciprocates up and down inside the barrel, um, the oil control ring um, creates and maintains a, a, an oil film on the cylinder walls. And the idea is that the compression rings uh, will hydroplane on that film of oil, minimizing metal to metal contact and minimizing the amount of wear uh, that is incurred um, as, the, uh, as, as the engine is running. Now, when they first maintain a, a, a manufacture these cylinders, the, the cylinders are, are, are machined by a, a CNC machine nowadays. Um, and initially the cylinder comes out with a mirror smooth finish on the inside of the barrel. Um, but a mirror smooth uh, finish will not, uh, will not do very well. And the problem is that it's impossible to coat a mirror smooth um, uh, surface with a film of oil. If you try to do that, the oil kind of beads up um, into discrete droplets instead of maintaining a, a, a consistent uh, film of lubricant, which is what we really want. So what we have to do, uh, so and, and, and engineers would, will say that, that the surface is not oil wettable. The, the oil beads up, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it can't be uh, uh, made into a, into a, a film uh, that covers the entire surface. So in order to make the, uh, the barrel oil wettable, the surface has to be roughened. And this is accomplished, um, th there are various techniques used, but it's basically accomplished by using a, um, a honing tool with a very hard, uh, usually a 220 grit stones that, that uh, are swirled up and down inside that smooth cylinder to create a crosshatch pattern of, of little tiny scratches. Um, and uh, you, you can kind of see that in the picture if you look really closely, you see a little bit better in this, in this picture. Um, and the, the, that crosshatch pattern that's machined into the cylinder walls um, is often called a micro finish because the scratches are very shallow. They're, they're typically only about 30 micro inches deep, 30 millionths of an inch. So it, they're, they're not very deep scratches, but they're deep enough to allow the oil to wet the surface. So when a, a cylinder is initially honed like this, <clears throat> um, if, if you looked at a cross section of it, and of course these scratches aren't very deep, but uh, so I'm exaggerating it, but you'd see a series of peaks and valleys being created by this, this hone. And the valleys or fissures um, that are, that are uh, honed into the cylinder wall is what makes it uh, oil wettable because these little valleys provide kind of a foothold for the oil to, to hang on to, to, to adhere to the surface that it can't do if the surface is perfectly smooth. But the peaks are, the thing, are, are, are problematic um, because they increase friction they cause the barrels to run hot. And so what we're trying to accomplish when we break in a cylinder is to smooth off those peaks while leaving the valleys intact. Uh, the valleys will allow the cylinder to be oil wettable and, and, and uh, grinding off those peaks or smoothing them out so that they're not so sharp um, will, will allow the lubricant to um, um, to let the rings hydroplane and, and avoid metal to metal contact, at least uh, during most of the stroke. Um, so that's what we're trying to accomplish when we break in a cylinder. And it would be kind of nice if the factory did this for us before they ship the cylinders. To some extent, that, that, that's true. Um, some cylinders are made with a multi-step honing process where they put a finer hone in the cylinder after they do the initial cross hatching in order to at least start the process of, of smoothing off those peaks. Um, and after that, all um, factory new and rebuilt engines from both Continental and Lycoming and um, from some overhaul shops, not all, but some 
the engines are run in a test cell for an hour or so. Um, and that test cell, that, that test cell run uh, kind of starts the break-in process a little bit, but it's not very long test cell run. Um, and it's, uh, and most of the test cell run is not at, at, at very high power. So it only does a little bit of the, of the break-in. So if, if you get an engine that's been running a test cell, the, the, the cylinders, the, the break-in process has been started for you. Um, but, but not every overhaul shop uh, does a test cell run. And certainly if you replace cylinders in the field, um, th there's no run in at all because you're just getting the freshly honed cylinder from whoever honed it, whether it's a new cylinder or a reconditioned cylinder and you're putting it on the engine. So you're gonna be the very first person to, uh, uh, to, to, to be running with that cylinder. And so in all cases, the, at least the final part of the break-in, if not all of it, is, <clears throat> is left to whoever it is who flies the airplane right after <clears throat> the cylinders are installed or maybe the engine is installed. So with that as, ba as background, let, let's talk about the basics of, of the break-in process. Um, during normal engine operation, our goal is to lubricate the cylinder battle barrel with an oil film uh, that is sufficiently strong and sufficiently thick uh, to prevent metal-to-metal -metal contract between the rings and the cylinder barrel wall. The idea is that the, the rings should hydroplane on, on the oil film, kind of like a water skier, um, and that, that that film of lubricant will prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact between the rings and the barrel. Uh, now, there's always some contact uh, in particular at top dead center where the cylinder, where the piston comes to a stop and reverses direction. Um, you know, if, if you imagine a water skier and you decided to um, turn the boat, and reverse his direction, uh, the, the water skier would kind of start to sink into the lake and, until he reestablished enough, uh, enough velocity to, to be able to hydroplane on the water. And the same thing is true of the rings. So we do get some metal to metal contact right at top dead center. And that's why a cylinder that's been in service for a while has a, a kind of a noticeable wear mark right at, uh, at the top dead center called the ring step area where the rings are reversing direction. But at least for most of the stroke, um, the objective is to keep uh, uh, prevent metal to metal contact with this film of lubrication. Uh, but during the break-in process, our goal is exactly the opposite. We, we want to breach the oil film and we want to cause sufficient metal-to-metal -metal contact to grind off those sharp peaks of the, of the, the honing, the crosshatch uh, that was honed into the cylinder. So in order to accomplish this, um, first of all, we need to run the engine really hard for the first hour or two. Now, the reason that that helps is because it is combustion pressure that presses the compression rings against the cylinder wall. Uh, our, our, our compression rings are what are called semi-trapezoidal rings, and they're, they're made in a shape um, so that uh, the, the combustion gas pressure gets behind the rings and presses them against the cylinder wall. That's what really causes them to, uh, to seal up against the cylinder wall. Um, and actually the diameter of the cylinder is not quite constant as the piston goes up and down. There, there's some choking in the, in the cylinder. And, and so uh, that ring actually has to reposition itself in or out of the, uh, of the groove in order to maintain contact. And it's the combustion gases themselves that press the ring up against the cylinder wall. So for break-in, we, we want to maximize that pressure and we wanna make sure that the peak combustion pressures are as high as possible uh, in, in order to, uh, to, to actually force metal to metal contact and grind those peaks off. The other thing that's important is that the oil film not be too strong to be breached. Um, so the choice of break-in oil is important. Um, in fact, traditionally, break-in has been done with what's called straight mineral oil, which is uh, pretty much unadulterated dead dinosaurs to which 
no synthetics have been added, no ashless dispersants have been added, no anywhere or any scuff additives uh, or viscosity index improvers have been added. All of those things are additives that are normally found in normal operating oil, but traditionally break-in has been done with this stuff called straight mineral oil that doesn't, doesn't have any of those additives that, that um, because we, we really don't want the oil film to be so strong that we can't breach it. And we really don't want any anywhere any scuff additives, which are things that chemically interfere with, uh, with friction. Um, we, we don't want those during the break-in process. They're all very helpful uh, under normal operating conditions, but since during break-in, we're trying to accomplish just the opposite, um, we, we want to avoid all of those additives. <clears throat> now, in, in recent years, some manufacturers and overhaul shops have been moving away from recommending an oil that's quite that primitive as straight mineral oil. Um, and uh, so um, uh, we'll talk about the, the kinds of oil that are appropriate for break-in, but uh, straight mineral oil is not really the only choice that we have. And um, uh, it's, I'm, I'm not that big a fan of using straight mineral oil for break-in. But there are some things we want to make sure we don't have in the oil during the break-in process. We don't want any synthetics uh, oil. We want uh, just plain um, petroleum-based oils. Synthetics have a higher film strength, and, and, and that's usually a good thing. <laughs> Um, but it's not a good thing for break-in because we, we don't want a really strong uh, film that can prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact. So we want to avoid any synthetics in the oil. We also, as I just mentioned, want to avoid any anywhere or any scuff additives um, because effectively what we're trying to achieve during break-in is scuffing. We're, we're trying to, 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 uh, to grind off those, those peaks from the hone pattern. Um, and anywhere and any scuff additives, uh, sometimes they're called extreme pressure additives. There are various names for them, but they're things that, that sort of chemically interfere with the friction process. And um, again, they're usually very good, um, but they kind of defeat what we're trying to do during break-in. So we don't want any anywhere, any scuff additives um, in the, uh, the break-in oil. Um, on the other hand, ashless dispersants which are uh, things that are uh, additives that are designed to keep the engine clean and to prevent sludge formation. Um, I've never actually seen any um, persuasive ed evidence that ashless dispersants interfere with the break-in process in any way because they're not friction modifiers. They're, 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 basically, thing, they're, they're, they're basically things that keep um, blow by uh, particulate matter that blows past the rings in suspension so that they, it doesn't contaminate the inside of the engine with sludge. And during the break-in process, um, because the rings aren't sealing very well to begin with, uh, there's, there's lots of particulate blow-by. The, the, the blow-by is, is, um, is very dirty. And so I prefer to break in using um, an ashless dispersant oil. Um, the picture on this slide is Airshell W100. I've done a lot of break-in using Airshell W100 which is a normal operating oil, but it's a simple operating oil uh, that, that, that doesn't have a lot of additives in it, but it does have ashless dispersants in it. Um, and and it's an it's a excellent break-in oil in my experience. It seems to work very well. Um, there has been some controversy about whether it's better to use single weight oil for break-in or multi-grade oil like this uh, Phillips uh, XC20W50, which is all, again, um, a multi-grade oil with no synthetics in it and not a lot of uh, additives, um, no, no um, any scuff additives. Um, and while my experience has mostly been using um, W100 for break-in, um, there's a moderately persuasive argument for using um, multi-grade oil. And I know a lot of people have been successful using the Phillips multi-grade oil for, um, for break-in. Um, the things we wanna avoid using during break-in as far as oil, um, the, the left one is uh, Aeroshell 15W50, which is a semi-synthetic with 
50% synthetics and 50% petroleum base. Uh, it's heavy in synthetics. We don't want to use it for braking. It also has a lot of anti-scuff and anti-wear uh, uh, additives in it. Uh, Exxon Elite actually is no longer on the market, um, but it was it was also a, a, a semi-synthetic oil, not quite as synthetic as the Aeroshell product. It was 25% uh, synthetics, but we 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 want to avoid synthetic oil during the break-in. Um, the next one over is, is Aeroshell W100 plus, which is a single weight oil, but the plus part of it means that, that a, a bunch of anti-scuff stuff has been added and also some corrosion preventative additives have been added to it. Um, no problem with the corrosion preventative additives, but, but the anti-scuff additives will, will make it hard to, to, to break in the cylinder. Uh, the next bottle next to it is, is CamGuard, which is an aftermarket additive that I like a lot, but not for break-in. We don't, it's, it's got a lot of friction modifiers in it. We don't want to use it. And, and the last uh, picture there is, is Lycoming uh, LW16702 snake oil. It's, uh, it's a, a tricresyl phosphate and it's an anti-scuff um, additive uh, that Lycoming recommends using. Uh, and again, it would be a good idea not to use something like that um, in, in break-in oil. So those are the things we, we want to avoid. Okay, so we picked the right oil. The next thing is, is how, how we run the engine when we're breaking it in. We, we want to run the engine as hard as we possibly can during break-in, but, but, but how hard? Um, in my view, and, and that's this is where a lot of the, the, the different advice that you'll read will, will differ on what the best procedure is. Ideally, um, we would like to run the engine as hard as possible, as close to 100% power as we can for about an hour or two. If we can do that, we're going we're, we're gonna to get the break-in done um, in short order. Um, but we need to be careful not to over-temp the cylinders. Um, and so, um, and new cylinders or freshly honed cylinders will naturally run hotter than normal until the break-in process is complete. Because until we grind those peaks off, the, there's an abnormal amount of friction. Um, and uh, so uh, cylinders it's, it always run hotter during initial break-in than they do once they've broken in. So, by far the best way to do this, in my view, is to have an engine monitor installed. Um, and, and I recommend everybody who flies behind piston engines should, should have a, some kind of a decent uh, digital engine monitor installed. And in this case, we, we want an instrument that will display the cylinder head temperature on every cylinder. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of engine monitor it is. It can be a, a cheap, uh, entry level unit, it can be a fancy one, doesn't matter, as long as we're able to monitor the cylinder head temperature of each cylinder. And given an engine monitor, what I would recommend is to do the break-in by running as close to maximum power as possible. If you can get away with running 100% power, that's great. Um, as, as much as high power as possible without letting any of the cylinders get too hot. And too hot, during break-in, I would define as anything over 420 degrees Fahrenheit for continental cylinders or anything over 440 degrees Fahrenheit for Lycoming cylinders. Now, these temperatures are, are hotter than we would normally like the cylinders to run um, once they've broken in, but they're not any, any, anywhere close to uh, the manufacturer's red lines. The continental's red line is normally 460. Lycoming's is normally 500. Um, so we're, we're not talking about running the cylinders at redline CHT, but we can allow them to get a little bit hotter than we would normally want to see um, after, during normal operation after the break-in has been done. If you can run the engine at, at, at close to 100% power for an hour or two without over-temping any of the cylinders, obviously if, if the cylinders get above these temperatures, you want to reduce power a little bit until they come down to within those temperatures. But if we can do that for about an hour or two, um, we'll, we'll get 95% of the break-in done within an hour or two. 
And you'll be able to tell because the, the cylinders will start off running hotter than normal. And then at some time during that first hour or two that you're flying at high power, the cylinder head temperatures will no noticeably uh, start to come down. Um, uh, and, and that will kind of tell you that you've, that you've accomplished your mission. Um, it's very important to run the engine hard right from the outset when we first put the cylinder into service. We want to avoid doing much ground operation or, or, or much idle or taxi operation. We don't want to do a protracted run up. We don't want to cycle a prop a whole bunch of times. We basically want as quickly as possible after engine start um, to, to take off at full power and to run the engine at as close to full power as we can for, for an hour or two. The, the reason it's important to avoid um, low power operation uh, when we're trying to break in a cylinder uh, is that operating a, a freshly honed cylinder at low power can cause a condition known as glazing. Um, at low power, there's not much pressure pushing the rings against the cylinder wall. Um, and, and so we'll, we, we'll get a lot of, of uh, hot blow by that will carbonize the oil that, that are in those uh, that are in those grooves that were honed into the cylinder. And if that, if that carbonized oil, um, uh, you know, gets baked enough to create a, a, a hard varnish, it will stop the, the break-in process. And, and we'll, no matter how long we run, we'll never be able to break that cylinder in properly. We'll actually have to take the cylinders off and re-hone them and start all over again. So we want to avoid that. Here's kind of a, a schematic diagram of what I'm talking about here. The, the left-hand panel shows um, a freshly honed cylinder with those sharp peaks. Uh, the middle panel shows kind of like what we're trying to accomplish, is, which, is to, which is to grind off the peaks and leave the valleys. And the right-hand panel shows a glazed cylinder where, where that hone pattern has gotten filled in with, with hard carbonized oil uh, varnish that prevent the, uh, the, the break-in process from proceeding further. So we want to try to avoid that. The way we avoid that is to minimize low power operation until we get that first hour of high power operation. Don't spend a lot of time uh, running on the ground, taxiing, doing a run up, all that stuff. We, 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 we want to uh, minimize that and we want to get to the high power phase just as quickly as we can uh, during, especially during that very, very first flight after the cylinders are installed or the engine is installed. So the basic rules for break-in is use the right oil, the, uh, something with no synthetics, no anti-scuff in it. Uh, AD oil is, is okay. Multi-grade oil is okay. As long as it's a simple oil with, with no synthetics and no uh, friction modifiers. Um, run the engine as hard as you can, as close to 100% power as you can without the cylinder head temperature getting to abusive levels. And again, I would suggest limiting CHT to 420 on continentals and 440 on Lycomings. And to minimize ground and low power operations uh, at, at first until the break-in has been accomplished to avoid the possibility of glazing the cylinders. And if you follow these rules, uh, breaking normally happens quite quickly. And the, the quicker it, it happens, the, the, the better job you're gonna do. How long should it take? You know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff says, you know, the break-in process should take 25 hours um, or uh, don't drain the break-in oil until you've got 25 hours on it. I, I, I disagree with that. I like to get the break-in oil out as quickly as possible because first of all, it's not a not very good oil. And second of all, it tends to get really filthy during break-in. So I normally drain break-in oil in, in no more than 10 hours. Um, steel cylinders will normally break in within the first couple of hours, uh, uh, five hours tops. If, if the cylinder hasn't broken in in five hours, you've done something wrong and, and uh, and it may be that the cylinder got glazed and, and you're not going to be able to get it broken in at all without removing it and rehoning it. 
Um, you, you can get actually a pretty good look at that with a borescope if you're curious about it, but it's best not to, not to have to do that because nobody wants to take the cylinders off and, and rehone them right after the cylinders were installed. Um, nickel carbide cylinders, they tend to break in very, very quickly um, because the, the little carbide particles that are embedded in the nickel plating um, serve as a very effective grinding compound and uh, the, those things break in very quickly. With nickel carbide cylinders, actually, we're, we're not really breaking in the cylinder walls. They, they aren't honed in the traditional way. We're, we're kind of breaking in the rings instead. Um, and the rings that are used with nickel carbide cylinders are, are softer and they typically are, are plasma faced rings. So the, the break in is very, very quick with nickel carbide cylinders. Channel chrome cylinders uh, take longer there. That's another case where you're really not breaking in the cylinder uh, because chrome is so hard that it's, it's, you're never gonna do anything with it wear wise. Um, but chrome, channel chrome cylinders are run with, with plain cast iron rings and the break-in process is actually breaking in the cast iron rings. And that can take quite a bit longer. Uh, breaking in channel chrome cylinders can, can, can take 25 hours and we never actually will get as low oil consumption with, with, with channel chrome cylinders as we would with, with steel cylinders or certainly with nickel carbide cylinders. Uh, channel chrome has a lot of advantages. It's very, very hard. It's, it's completely corrosion resistant. Um, it does burn more oil. That's not necessarily a, a horrible thing. Um, but nowadays, um, more and more people who uh, operate in high corrosion environments um, where steel cylinders can be a problem uh, will opt for nickel carbide cylinders rather than channel chrome cylinders because the nickel carbide cylinders are equally hard uh, and they break in extremely quickly and, and they burn very little oil uh, compared to, to channel chrome. But at any rate, the, how long the break-in should take depends on what kinds of cylinders you have. But if you're dealing with, with standard steel cylinders through hardened or, or nitrided cylinders, um, you definitely should be able to complete the break-in within five hours. And um, if, if you do things right and uh, and I would recommend getting rid of the break-in oil in no more than 10 hours because it's going to be, it's going to have a, a lot of filth in it, a lot of little metal in it that was ground off the, the hone patterns and it's just best to get rid of it. Uh, get rid of it, put a new filter in and start off with a start out with your, op, with your normal operating oil. It has all of the, the good, you know, friction modifiers and anti-corrosion additives and all that kind of stuff that we want in a, in a good operating oil. Um, so that's all of the prepared material I have. Um, I, I, one of my four books that you can get on Amazon or from Aircraft Spruce or EAA is, uh, is my book on engines and it has a lot more stuff about you know, break-in and other aspects of engines if you're interested. It's, it's not quick bathroom reading, it's 508 pages or something like that, but it's, uh, it, it's a pretty thorough treatment of, uh, of a lot of what I've learned about piston aircraft engines over the years. And uh, guys with that, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to any uh, questions and answers. I put my, my contact material on the screen in case somebody wants to send me an email or something. I'm happy to answer questions that way as well. Mike, it's always a pleasure having you back. And this was some very helpful information that you shared with us this evening. And the timing of having you on tonight for me personally, for selfish reasons, was pretty awesome because my little Luscom 8E just came out of the annual last Thursday, and I haven't touched the aircraft uh, because I knew you would be coming on the program, and I had to add a new cylinder this annual, so I'm going to be breaking in one new cylinder. So with that being said, what kind of tips, uh, little general tips would you say that I could do for breaking in just that one cylinder compared to breaking on a whole new engine. Okay, I think I will go back to letting you see my face. Can you can you see that now? Did I put my camera back on? Yes, uh, looks sir. like I did. Okay. Um, well, you know, there's not anything really um, 
special about breaking in one cylinder. It's the same procedure. Um, but of course, while you're breaking in that one cylinder, you're, you're running the engine real hard and you're running it with suboptimal oil. So you, you got an extra incentive to do it quickly. So the, the, the other cylinders that aren't being broken in don't have to put up with all of that stuff for very long. Um, so again, if you, if you follow this, this guidance, um, and I assume you're on your Luscom, you're probably talking about steel cylinders. Yes. Um, you, you ought to be able to get, get most of it done in an hour, uh, hour or two max, right. and then go back to your normal procedures. All right. It's an 85 horsepower continental. So, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. So Mike, pure mineral oil is, um, you said pure dinosaur. So one of the guys out there is a paleontologist and he actually texted me. So why does that have to be dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> no, it probably, it probably doesn't, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's very, very, very old stuff that we pull up out of the ground. You know, I was kind of joking about it. It is pure. It is pure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the point is it's not man-made. It's, it's natural. Yeah. And yeah, uh, there's one in every crowd, isn't there? I tell yeah. you. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, the question came up that um, whenever, uh, when, when you stop your airplane, uh, not to take the prop and reposition the prop by hand whenever it's done, um, do you recommend against that? And if so, why? Is there anything that it does to the engine? When, when you, when you whenever, shut down whenever, the engine to reposition the prop so that it's horizontal or something? Yeah, somebody had asked, they said that they had heard that that was a bad idea. Uh, no, there's, there's nothing bad about it. Um, there's... There's some people who don't like uh, to, who recommend not touching the prop because they're afraid you might have a hot mag and get hurt. Uh, there are some people who caution you against turning the prop backwards because it, it might fracture a vein on a vacuum pump. Uh, I, I've been turning props backwards for years and I've never <laughs> had a problem with a vacuum pump. So I think that's pretty much of an old wives tale. Um, now the, the one thing I do disrecommend that, that that's kind of marginally related to what you ask and maybe that was that's where the confusion came from is is people will often ask me you know if my airplane is idle and I can't fly it or start the engine for a extended period of time is it a good idea to go down uh, and and rotate the prop by hand every week or so to quote redistribute the oil unquote and I always say no that's not a good idea um, it will redistribute the oil. The problem is it will redistribute the oil in a bad play in a bad way. Uh, the, the, when, when an engine sits, you know, gravity wants to redistribute the oil from from top to bottom, and so the things up at the top of the engine, on the top of the cylinder barrels and stuff, are always the place that loses the oil film earliest, and that's where, if corrosion is going to happen, that's typically where it's going to happen. Um, that's also why Lycomings have more cam and lifter problems than Continentals because their cam is mounted up at the top of the engine and Continentals are, are, are mounted down below the crankshaft where the crankshaft will, will, will drip oil and, and relubricate the cam for a long time after you shut the engine down. But by turning the prop by hand, you're sort of accelerating that process of, of oil going from top to bottom. And, and so it's, I, I, I don't think that's a good idea. But repositioning the prop after you shut down in order to, you know, be nice to other people taxiing down the row or helping it fit in the hangar better or something, that's not a problem at all. Okay. Mike, uh, how does the oil get on the cylinder wall at the top of the stroke where the oil control ring never reaches? Um, well, that's a good question. There, and, and there actually is less oil up there than, than, than there would be elsewhere. Um, the, the oil is, um, uh, it, you know, is, is splashed on the bottom of the piston, uh, typically by the, the spinning uh, crankshaft. The, the oil is getting extruded out of the bearings on the crankshaft, and the crankshaft is, is throwing it as an oil spatter in all directions so that the crankcase when the engine's running, it's just full of a full of oil mist, and and a bunch of that spatter and oil or, or splash oil is splashed on the bottom of the pistons. The pistons have these little holes in them that let the oil 
get through to the to to the oil control ring, and then the oil control ring is responsible for metering the the oil on the cylinder walls. And you're right, there's not a lot of lubrication at the very very top of the stroke, which is another reason where why that's always where the the ring step area is. I, I mean, you know, the the compression rings are going to carry some of the oil up every time they they, they rise up towards top dead center. But there's but there's definitely less lubrication up there, and there's less, you know, there's there's a period of time where there's almost no hydrodynamic lubrication because the the rings come to a stop and then reverse direction, so they they will they'll sink through whatever well film is there, and uh, that's why we do have a noticeable ring step at the very top of the stroke when we look at a at a cylinder say with a bore scope after it's been you know run. Five six hundred hours, you can see it pretty pretty distinctively. Thank you. Cool. Um, for those people out there that have a, a couple partners on an airplane, um, and then they have a, a, an overhaul done on their engine, how do you? What would you recommend for getting everybody to to follow the same process and procedure for breaking that engine in, or would you say just take a person break, break it in for the five or ten hours that it takes uh, to make sure that it's done properly? What what would you what are your thoughts on that? Well, the you know the 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 first flight after the cylinders have been installed or the engine was installed is is the really critical one, and and so you know whoever whoever in the partnership is the most maintenance savvy. Most 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 partnerships and airplanes have like a designated maintenance officer, or somebody who's supposed to kind of be the the, the maintenance savvy person in the group. Uh, he should probably be the one that that either does the that initial flight or or carefully briefs whoever is going to do it to make sure that they're doing the right thing. And it, you know it's not it's not complicated. It's it, it's you know minimize ground running and then run the engine as hard as you can for an hour or so. It's 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 not rocket science. And that's why I'll never be the maintenance officer in a partnership. To be the first <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy, your turn. Sorry. This is really related to uh, oil or engine break-in, but I'm a multi-engine instructor. You're a multi-engine instructor. And the ACS requires that we do a full engine shutdown feather for a multi-engine applicant uh, in preparation for a multi-engine add-on. And some mechanics have said that, no, you don't really want to shut an engine down because it's really bad for the engine. Some have said it won't hurt it. Um, the bottom line is we have to do it regardless because the FAA requires it to do it. So what is your take on whether um, shutting down an engine in flight on a twin um, will hurt the engine or, or not? Or, and then if so, what are some tips to help mitigate the risk of uh, hurting the engine. Well, I I don't like to do engine shutdowns in twins. That's one of the reasons I'm such a big fan of d doing training in in simulators for for twin pilots, and wh why I spend many 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 thousands of dollars a year doing it myself. It's not cheap, but uh, but the hardware is pretty expensive too. Um, but but you're right. You 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 know. You, if you're taking a check ride, you don't really have a choice. They're, 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 you're not going to be able to say, I, I want to do it in a sim. Um, so, you know, what I have always done, and, and like as I say, I've been aggressive at minimizing the number of actual shutdowns that I've ever done in my airplane. But w when it's unavoidable, um, what I've done is to have a talk with the instructor or the examiner and said and said, look, if if we're going to do a shutdown, I'd I'd like several minutes to be able to slowly cool the engine down before I pull the plug on it. I I, I don't want to take a bunch of hot cylinders and suddenly pull a mixture on on it. You know, if we if you want to test my ability to handle an engine out, we'll we'll, we'll do it at zero thrust. Uh, if 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 we need to actually shut the engine down and do a restart. Um, you know, give me a few minutes to do that. Don't, 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 let's not be in a rush to do it. Cause I, I really would like to minimize the, the, the temperature gradient. Um, I actually, my engine monitor, I've, I've got programmed so that it, it alarms 
if the cool down rate on any of the cylinders exceeds uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit per minute, um, which is fairly conservative. Lycoming has a public recommendation that you not cool down cylinders any faster than 60 Fahrenheit per minute. Uh, I have my alarm set at, at half that rate. And I like to try to, to keep the cool down rate limited to, to 30 degrees a minute. So that means that if, if we're gonna shut the engine down, we've got to take several minutes at least to, to, to start cooling it down uh, before we pull the plug on it. And uh, I'm assuming that it would matter whether it's turbocharged or, or normally aspirated, or aspirated de depending on, on how you want to shut the engine down or whether it would hurt the engine or not. Um, would that make a difference? I don't think that really makes any difference. Okay. So for um, for a light coming engine, um, I, you know, light coming out, they they do recommend leaning the uh, the engine running at Lena Peak. What, what do you suggest for that as far as on the break in? Is that a change in the the standard procedure, or do you just run it hard with the same leaning procedures that you normally would use for normal operations? I I would not. I'm I'm a huge Lena Peak person myself, and I, I operate my airplane almost exclusively Lena Peak, except for takeoff and initial climb. But uh, braking is not the time for Lena P. We're, we're, we're trying to run the engine hard. If we're running the engine anywhere near 100% power, um, we, we need the, the extra fuel flow for, uh, to, to, to get an adequate detonation margin, especially if it's a hot day. Uh, but more important than that, we're trying to get max, we're trying to maximize peak combustion pressure which is not what we're trying to do under normal operation, but it is what we're trying to do during break-in. So I don't, I would not recommend using Lena Peak during that, during that first couple of break-in flights. Okay. Uh, when you're breaking in an engine, and do you do, you do this with full rich? And, and you actually said this, but do you full rich or do you lean the engine to some degree at all? That was one of the things that you talked about. But just to kind of highlight, you do want to run it full rich. Does that matter at what um, density altitude your fuel is, say sea level versus someplace in Colorado? Well, uh, yeah, if you're normal aspirate, of course, it makes a lot of difference what the density altitude is. Um, and, and it's very, very hard to, to do a good job of a break-in if you're, if you're based in Colorado, because you, you know, everything to the wall is only giving you 75% power. Um, it is what it is, but that's not the optimum place to be breaking in cylinders, uh, in a normally aspirated engine. Turbocharged engine, of course, doesn't matter because you're going to be able to get full power at, at any reasonable density altitude. Um, but I'm um, uh, not sure if I, if I totally answered your question or not, if, if I didn't. Close enough. <laughs> ask, ask me more. Yeah. Oh, you, you, were, you, you were asking about leaning. And, and again, it's a question of what, if you're running 100% power, you probably don't want to be leaning. If, if you're running at, at 75 or 80% power, you, know, you, you, you do want to be leaning, but we, you know, we, we, the most important thing is to keep the cylinder head temperatures from becoming unreasonable. So you're not gonna be wanting to lean very aggressively um, because it, rich a peak, we're gonna have to be quite a ways rich a peak to keep the CHTs down. Lean a peak, uh, we probably don't wanna do just because we're, that's, you're not gonna get peak combustion pressures, lean a peak. So, and again, I'm only talking about the first hour or two. I'm not talking about a prolonged period of time. Gotcha. Jeremy, is it your question or mine? I forgot. Ask another question. What, what are some old wives' tales that you've ha heard about break-in that are not true? Well, you know, uh, a, a, I've read a lot of, of recommendations. Uh, I mentioned a whole bunch of people have weighed in on this that, 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 First of all, talk, talk about breaking in the engine at no more than 75% power. I, I kind of understand why they made the recommendation. They made the recommendation because they were assuming that the airplane had crappy instrumentation, which is what 
legacy airplanes came with a factory with not nowadays we tend to have pretty spectacular instrumentation on new airplanes and more than 50 percent of the fleet is retrofitted an engine monitor as best as i can recommend and i'm trying to get the rest of the 50 percent of the fleet to to follow suit and you know if you if you have bad engine instrumentation where where you don't have CHT probes on each cylinder and you don't know what the temperatures are the the you know the cylinder the people who are making these recommendations well they don't want you to cook the cylinders to death and since they can't tell you to limit CHT because you don't know what CHT is the only thing they can do is to say well don't don't run it more than 75 percent power but you know that that's going to um, prolong the the break-in process and and make it less likely to succeed. And so if you do know what cylinder head temperatures are, and I hope most of you do, then you don't want to limit your, your power to 75% power. You want to run as much power as you possibly can without over-tempering the cylinders. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know if you want to call that an old wives tale, but an awful lot of the break-in stuff that you read is predicated on the airplane not having uh, CHT information on, on each cylinder. Um, another thing I, I see in quite a few of the recommendations is this complicated ritual where they say, well, we want you to run for 75% power for five minutes and then 65% power for five minutes. And this was elaborate dance. And to me, that that really doesn't, doesn't make very much sense. We, we, we want to run as high power as we can get away with um, and, and get this, this agony over with as quickly as we can and then get the dirty oil out of the airplane and start flying it the normal way. That, that's, that's kind of my approach to the, to the whole problem. Cool, one last question, Jeremy, and then we'll, uh, we'll let Mike go. Mike, you have time for one more? Sure, I got plenty of time. Hey, um, so the, the, the question that I'd like to ask, and this is, uh, it's almost like a therapy session, right? What is the one thing in aviation engines that drives you nuts that you hear so much and you just wish you could drill home to intermediate to, to newer pilots uh, when it comes down to, to owning an airplane, engines, and how to maintain and take care of them? Um, what drives me nuts? Um, how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, it's almost like a therapy. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll give you the top three or four things that drive me nuts. That it just kind of comes to the top of my head. One thing that drives me absolutely crazy are aircraft owners, especially if they're my clients, who will get, a, get their airplane out of a heavy annual inspection, load their wife, kids, and dogs into the airplane and go fly off to the Bahamas. Um, they don't understand the notion of a, of a post-maintenance test flight. They don't understand that the most likely time for the hardware to, to fail them is right after the airplane comes out of maintenance. Um, there's this somehow this concept that, oh, well, it just came out of an annual inspection, so it must be perfect, which is exactly the opposite of the truth. So that's one of the things that drives me nuts. Pe people need to take post-maintenance test flights seriously. They, they need to be done with only required crew member aboard, which for most of us is one pilot. They need to be done in VFR conditions. They need to be done close to an airport in case something goes wrong. And they need to be done with a test pilot's mindset. So that, that's, that's the number one thing that drives me nuts. Another thing that drives me nuts is how trigger happy many, many a ps are about removing cylinders. Um, in, in, in I, I seem like I spend half of my life saying no to mechanics about removing cylinders. Uh, cylinder removal and reinstallation is a high risk operation. Uh, a lot of, of catastrophic engine failures occur right after cylinder work. And I've been involved as an expert witness in too many of those. That, and and um, uh, so, I do not like to see cylinders removed unless you have absolutely no alternative. Um, and, um, um, and, I, and, and I really don't like to see 
multiple cylinders removed at once because that's an even higher risk. So the whole notion of a top overhaul gives me the willies. Um, there are things that can be done to mitigate the risk of cylinder removal. I've written about it quite extensively. I've done webinars about it. But most mechanics don't take those risk mitigation steps. And, and in my view, most mechanics don't approach cylinder replacement with, with a prudent level of fear, if you will, <laughs> that, that this is a high risk thing and it's very easy to screw up. Um, so that's that's maybe number two on my list of things that drive me nuts. Let me think, think if there's any other biggie that I can mention. So not to interrupt you, the biggest risk mitigation I found is bring the mechanic with you. It's a, <laughs> a, before he gets in the plane, I, all of a sudden know, it's like, oh, you know, take this? Paul, I have frequently <laughs> been quoted accurately as saying, if I were ever FAA administrator for a day, which by the way, ain't gonna happen, um, the first thing I would do is is change the regulations so that the mechanic who signed off an annual is obligated to go up on the post maintenance <laughs> test flight. <laughs> I think it would be a marvelous motivator. But be, uh, I but, love it. Yeah, but ain't gonna. You, know, you always hear that. You always hear that. Oh, let me check this. It's like, wait a minute. When I was gonna fly it, there was no checking anything. Yeah. Now that you're getting it, it's like, let me check this. What, what's up with it? Of course, I, I've had some discussions with 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 A and P's. Um, and I say, you know, why, why don't you why don't you participate in the post maintenance test flight? And they say, well, I, I don't we, we don't like to do that, but it's not the airplane we're worried about. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so, well, I, I, my my mind is is drawing a blank. It may be fatigue, but those are the those are the 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 two things that drive me nuts that just came to mind, so. Well, Mike, it is a maybe, pleasure. Maybe we should, maybe we'll do another, another webinar on things that drive Mike nuts. Yeah, there <laughs> and you I, go. Yeah, and I'll spend some, I'll spend some time making. I'm gonna write that down and we'll follow <laughs> up with you on that because that's a great idea. Would you like four hours or five hours? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, on that note, Mike, once again, I really appreciate you coming back to the program and this will be uploaded to the YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. And of course, I can't thank you uh, enough. And, you know, if you don't mind, I'd love to have you come back in another six or seven months or so, if you're willing. And sure, we can absolutely. Talk about what drives Mike's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure out something to talk about anyway. I, that, that's great talking points. So Mike, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and close the program out now. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you've got any questions for myself or recommendations um, or how to improve this program or how we can get other guests on board, shoot me a note at flyallamerican at gmail.com. And you all also saw Mike's information in the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I can forward you that information if, uh, if you need help finding it as well. Uh, follow uh, Follow me on social media on the All American Aviation YouTube channel, Facebook page, Instagram, and one quick admin note, Paul's work schedule has gotten atrocious. So Paul will be helping when he can. Uh, next um, webinar, we're going to have another co-host uh, join us to be determined. And if any of you guys are interested in interviewing to help be a co-host in the future, please shoot me a note. I've already got a couple of people in mind that I'm going to ping, but I want to also publicly thank Paul for all of his hard work and dedication to breaking the chain because he's been there uh, as a, the technical guru, backed me up with Q&As, kept me straight, and he will be joining us again in the future, that we know, but he, his work schedule has gotten to be pretty demanding. Uh, I'd like to also invite you all to please come back on February 2nd at 7.30 Central uh, for our guest speaker, AOPA's president, Mark Baker. Mark Baker will be here on February 2nd at 7.30 p.m. Central to talk about why it is important for us as aviators to join together and collaborate to, for the greater good for aviation.
I want to leave you with this final quote, bad news. Uh, the bad news is that time flies. The good news is, is you're a pilot. And you see Michael Alsula. I believe I said that correctly. I, I apologize if I botched up the uh, author's name of that quote. All right. From Paul, myself, and our guest speaker, uh, Mike Bush tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful night. Fly safe, keep learning, and never give up on a dream. So long. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>